Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. Now this is where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Andorra and this is what's coming up on the show today. Well, the job of the station manager is one that has changed over time, uh, more so with the introduction of digital elements such as social media and live streaming. We'll be unpacking how this job has changed and how the station managers are embracing this. We also find out why the South African media received a backlash uh, for, in fact, uh, we'll be looking at the uh, uh, dropping in standards in the uh, journalism arena. And uh, this has been highlighted uh, quite recently in the way that uh, we took on the story of uh, the ANC Secretary General's arrest. On our international editor feature this week, we take you to Sudan, where we'll find out what's making news there uh, on that part of the continent. And our Back in History feature, well, that takes us back to the year 1990 and 1993, respectively. Stay tuned to find out what happened in those years. So that's the show, but remember, you can engage with us on social media using the Twitter handle, hashtag SABC Media Monitor, and also share your views on the WhatsApp number. And that number is on your screen now, 065 862 4548. Right, before we uh, get into our highlighted stories on the programme, let's first take a look at what's on the front pages of your Sunday newspapers today. And we start with the Sunday Times. And uh, this paper is saying, uh, the headline there is shows us, uh, show us the money, which refers to the State Capture Commission trying to compel former President Jacob Zuma to appear before the commission and to hand over bank statements to at least 20 accounts linked to the Zuma family. This is hoped to rip the veil off thousands of potentially dodgy financial transactions. Uh, this is according to the paper. The City Press, uh, well that's leading with a look at a stark warning from the ANC Secretary General Ace Mahashule to the Hawks and the National Prosecuting Authority saying do not humiliate him publicly by arresting him publicly and spreading fake news. According to the paper, Mahashule says that there's no need for a media spectacle if any criminal charges are to be preferred against him. The Sunday Independent is leading with what they say could lead to a full-blown racial clash as angry protesters have warned white farmers who stormed a court building and set to light a police vehicle in the Free State and they would be given war if they wanted it. The protest organised by the ANC Youth League in Senegal in the east of the province accused the farmers of using crime as an excuse to undermine a democratically elected government. The Sunday Tribune has a Durban family on its uh, front page that's accusing police of repeatedly lying to the media about uh, uh, why members of the National Intervention Unit wrongfully riddled their car with gunfire, thinking that they were a gang of hijackers. According to witnesses and a ballistics expert hired by the family, police had their guns pointed on the occupants of the vehicle, which is contrary to the version stated by the SAPS uh, that claimed that the family was caught in the middle of a shootout between themselves and suspected hijackers. Well, the weekend Argus on Sunday is leading with the story of a woman who's uh, too afraid to go to work. The woman is accusing uh, traffic chief uh, Farrell Payne of sexual harassment. Public Works MEC Bonginkosi Madigazela said that he's expecting a report from the department's head on the appointment of the, of an, the appointment of an independent body to investigate the matter. The woman uh, is uh, said uh, in one incident, the traffic chief grabbed her by the jacket and told her that she looked lekker from behind. And the Sunday World has the former president, Jacob Zuma, on its front page. And uh, he and his wife, Tobeka, have decided to end their marriage. Uh, the paper is reporting that the former first lady also took uh, Zuma to court over maintenance issues. All right, so let's take a quick look at uh, what's trending on social media because a lot of people get their news from there, don't they? And this is the list and in fact it's mostly sport. Uh, the Bledsloe Cup is uh, 
been playing out, New Zealand versus Australia. And so the one, two, three, uh, four uh, Wallabies uh, 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 tweets are really, really taking up. And the usual suspects, the sacred space with Tamingo Benia every Sunday at this time, and uh, normally highlighting uh, what people are, are, are sharing on social media and on a Sunday especially. And uh, Sunday feels also the same kind of feeling. All right, so that's uh, what's trending on social media. And uh, there you go. Uh, John Eels, just imagine thinking Kane isn't best seven in the country. This is all the rugby. Uh, people very excited about uh, rugby underway. And uh, South Africa, I don't know that they're going to be able to be part of the championship uh, playing a little bit later in the year. We begin the programme with some sad news of the passing of the City Press uh, news, uh, uh, newspaper executive editor Dumisani Lubisi. Uh, Lubisi, who was uh, 44, died on Friday night, apparently from heart failure. The paper's editor-in-chief, Mondli Makanya, says that uh, the newsroom had lost a pillar, who he described as a stickler for accuracy. The South African National Editors Forum, Sanef, said his family, especially his uh, three sons, Tando, Sia and Wandile, are in our hearts and mind. And we express our deepest condolences to bring them comfort on the passing of their father, who was a young, energetic and vibrant soul. All right, so our condolences as a media fraternity to uh, the friends and family of uh, Dumisane Luvisi. Okay, let's uh, start the program now in earnest. Um, like other media industries, radio is being transformed and increasingly facing competition from new media platforms and changing consumer expectations. And this has meant experimenting with new ways of doing things and new ways of delivering content. One of the people at the front of uh, leading these changes is, uh, uh, in this rapidly evolving environment is the radio station manager. And they've had to develop new skills and business models as the digital revolution has rolled out. So just how has the role of the station manager been changing, particularly in recent times? We asked a couple of station managers and this is what they had to say. Indeed, as station managers, we are under pressure to find alternative revenue streams as well as increasing our audience share. But because there is competition from online platforms, our target market is now exposed to a wider choice than before with accessibility to information and entertainment. And nobody anticipated this. And also, uh, they are looking for credible content. As the station, we now use podcasts to keep the listener up to date with the station's content. The station manager position has evolved over time from just being an administrative one to being a, uh, a strategic position where you have to, as, as one of the key roles, being able to coordinate tasks um, within the management team. And on top of that, making sure that the station is able to generate uh, alternative revenue. You have to make sure that um, uh, the station is, is abreast of the latest trends within um, the industry. When talking about news, we give them as they happen. We don't have to wait for o'clock for us to break the news because obviously we are on social media. We are on YouTube, we are on all these online platforms where we can interact easily with uh, our audience. So if something happens now here in Alexandra, we can you know, post it and have a full comprehensive update at o'clock. We can also you know, direct the food traffic in terms, I mean the, the traffic in the, on our website where we can also generate you know, some revenue for the station so that the lights can continue to be on. So we continue to serve our mandate of informing, entertaining and also educating our community. Freelance journalist Justin Brown, who's also former editor of the City Press Business and Business Report, looked into the changing role of radio station managers, and this is what he told me. The station manager has also to deal with the demands of digital, digital channels, internet rivals, and data management. Um, so the radio station manager has to monitor audience 
behavior across several platforms. And these developments have all transformed the job. Give us, give us a, a sense of typically what do they do then on a day-to-day -day basis that they didn't do before. Give us some typical things that uh, you, you observed and some of the things that they told you. Some of the, I mean, previously it was just dealing with the AM or FM band yeah. broadcast, dealing with presenters. Um, but now they have to deal with all sorts of platforms, apps, social media, um, podcasts. Yeah. yeah um, so they also need to deal with a social media team, make sure that there's, that, that um, no one puts out anything that's going to get the station manager or the, or the presenter into trouble. Um, yeah, and make sure the technology works. So I think it's, it's yes. a more complicated. The digital disruption really changed the game that once we started streaming and once we became digitally aware, um, that changed everything. I think the biggest thing is the internet and social media, particularly social media. Um, so station managers say that there's no longer specifically in, specifically in radio anymore, but rather in con the content business, and that I FM and, and AM are really just channels, um, and the production of, of content for multi channel for numerous channels is now the, in our king, and people are seeking credible content like never before, um, and radio is radio radio can still capture a mood, a memory, a story, but radio is really now using new tools on the internet and social media to reach um, new audiences. So some of the radio stations see, the, see their new competitors as anyone that creates content on the internet. And, if, and the 5FM station manager, JD Master, told me that the reality is that um, technology has disrupted radio in such a way that everyone has become a content creator of sorts. And on top of um, the traditional um, FM and AM band, radio stations now have numerous touch points include social media, apps, podcasts, and digital radio. Um, and Jack Randolph, for instance, has nine different platforms and manages terrestrial radio, with terrestrial radio, its website, and the app being the most important. And at the same time, radio has slice of advertising pies under pressure due to the huge growth of the internet. Advertisers are looking for multi-platform solutions. Advertisers are increasingly comparing what radio stations have to offer with the major digital platforms like Google, Twitter, and Facebook. And this means that radio stations have, have had to adapt and evolve rapidly. Another factor cons to consider is that digital data costs are expected to fall sharply in South Africa, which would make the internet more accessible and consumers will devote more time to this and possibly less to radio. Um, so the reflection of the changing times of the Jacaranda FM and Cape Talk website audiences are, are already greater than their broadcast following. And Jacaranda has a website audience of 1.6 million when it's FM audience has a following of just over a million. And Cape Talk has a website audience of a million, while its terrestrial AM audience is between 75 and 80,000. So there's a huge gap there, yeah. um, especially with Cape Talk between its terrestrial audience, broadcast audience, and its website. I spent a bit of time in the UK, and one of the things that I used to do quite a bit when I was missing home is I would go online and listen to radio stations back home. And I guess what this means for the uh, radio station managers is that once upon a time, they had a local audience, but now this audience is all over the world, isn't it? Yes, the digital platforms allow radio stations to um, greatly increase their, ter their um, terrestrial broadcast audience. Um, there will be a local audience, as you say, both in and increase, take that audience internationally and nationally. So um, using its digital platform, Jacaran FM last year started a campaign to position itself as a national station. And by its app, Jacaranda is close to becoming, well, they say close to becoming the top digital station in the Western Cape, despite being a station based in Gauteng. And also digital audiences, a digital, having a digital broadcast um, allows Jacaranda to reach audiences in, internationally, including the UK, Australia and Dubai and South Africa, where a lot of South African expats are based. So yes, um, uh, d digital platforms give um, local radio stations a much more significant reach. So you mentioned an interesting word there. You said content. I mean, like, you know, radio, uh, our understanding when you say that, you, you think perhaps of a, 
little transistor radio or a stereo or something. Yeah, sure. And uh, so what's happened now is that w how you listen to this content has changed, but also you find that when you go on these websites, increasingly there's also video, isn't there? So it's yeah, totally. beyond just listening now. Yes, on the video front, um, Jacaranda FM and 5FM are both experimenting using video sharing social media pl platform TikTok. I'm told um, that, that um, video gets a much greater um, response than, than any other sort of content. Um, so yes, that is also broadening the um, radio stations also getting into video as well. And I think it's... Um, Jack Rand is experimenting and was a lot of 5FM presenters actually using it as a means to communicate with the audience. All right. So the station manager, as we knew it back in the day, is a different beast and different animal now because now it's a multi-platform content manager plus social media coordinator, I guess. This is really the job that they do now. Yes, I mean... It's, I mean, yeah, it is very exciting. It's evolving, exciting. It's transforming, changing, um, experiment with a lot of experimentation um, and, an, and an opportunity to develop a much greater audience than, than what was traditionally allowed by just a terrestrial broadcast of radio signal. Also now radio stations have got new competitors. Instead of just um, competing with another terrestrial radio station, they're going to have to compete with other um, with digital platforms like Google, Twitter, and Facebook, TikTok. Um, so that's you know, that's a new emerging um, well, new a new new competitors rather than just your traditional competitors. Even some online websites and like News Twenty Four is now considered to be a com potential competitor to radio stations, given the fact that they've got podcasts and webcasts, etc. Um, even webinars are becoming more increasingly so those are all things broadcast things are being broadcast on the internet that are going to compete with with radio as as both from advertising point of view as well as from the attention of the consumer welcome back you're still watching media monitor now last week if you remember we interrogated the difference between the criticism of the media and uh, the honest critiquing of the media, and that the two shouldn't be conflated. Well, there are some that say that journalism standards actually have been dropping for some time, and this is contributing to a loss in trust in news media. But what or who is causing this fall in the quality of journalism, if it's true? Well, one person believes that something needs to change and change urgently and uh, this is journalist uh, communication strategist and media trainer Temba Sipotagele who joins me now thanks very much indeed and welcome to the program good morning Peter good morning to your viewers and good morning to your team all right so let's begin with uh, the accusation that journalism standards are dropping what gave you that feeling what did you notice what did you observe It's quite really not what gave me the feeling, Peter. It's about what's happening. As a journalist uh, and a media trainer and a, and a community strategist, I often look at how we in the media, also again, as a member of the Press Council of South Africa, I look at what we in the media sometimes cover certain stories. And I find that in some instances, there are complaints about how we cover stories. And the Press Council is on record of about challenges, even silence itself, about challenges within the media. Uh, that, uh, that keep on dropping. But we are not at a crisis mode yet, but we need to ensure that we are journalists are to the basic channels of journalism. That's all we are trying to, to do. All right, so what do you think has caused this? Why have we found ourselves in this situation? It's, it's quite difficult to pinpoint where the actual challenges are, but one can zoom at the institutions of higher learning teaching journalism, where you find that most of the lectures have never even seen uh, how the newsroom operates, or they've never worked in the media. They just, you know, uh, come from academia, go straight into teaching and, and, and lecturing Chinese journalists. And one of the challenges is that if you look, may, maybe also on, on, on radio, you work with producers, guys that I've been working with now to prepare for the show, whereby some of the producers would just call a government spokesperson or a minister or premier or MEC 
to say that we need a soundbite without you proper research. So those are the kind of challenges that we also picked up. Apart from uh, just a serious uh, transgressors of, of, of challenge ethics, they are just basics that people are failing to adhere to. So are you suggesting that then there are people in charge who don't know what they don't know? One of the biggest challenges is um, that people normally allude to try to make it as if it's quite serious and big. It's, uh, the, we have entered the age of digital media, quite true. However, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't adhere to the basics of journalism. Journalism 101 says specifically, if I'm doing a story about an ex person, I should ensure that whoever gave me that story as a source, firstly, I interrogate and investigate that source. Two, verify the fact that the person gave me before I even go and get the other side of the story. Because also, get more side of the story as much as possible. Whether the story might be true or not, information that we are provided with, whether true or not, all that you have to do, dig deeper as journalists to satisfy yourself that you have, all, you have closed all the loopholes. Do you think that, that, that there's a, a pressure that's been created in terms of trying to get things out quickly. Now that we are in a digital world, now that we have social media competing with news outlets, that now sometimes some of these checks and balances are just not being done. Peter, pressure has been there. Pressure is part and parcel of journalism. However, everyone in the media want to go and get the school. Whether you are under pressure or not, but there are certain steps that one shouldn't miss in clearly getting in the information that one was given. Especially if you got information from the so-called faceless sources or nameless sources or trusted sources. The important thing is to ensure that you verify the information. Pressure is always there. Pressure will always be there. Competing social media, quite true. We are competing with, uh, with uh, social media online and stuff like that. However, that doesn't mean that we have to disregard the basic tenets of journalism. All right, let's talk about sources and um, sometimes how the subject of the story um, may or may not um, use the media to their own ends. Um, because as journalists, we often get given information. And I wonder if there aren't lessons. I mean, I think about what happened this week, uh, the Ace Mahashule uh, arrest warrant, which was and then wasn't. Um, it was denied afterwards. However, um, news sources published the story that it was going to happen. Then there was a series of denials. And I'm just wondering what the journalists could have done differently in this circumstance. Quite simple. When the story was uh, went online, IOL online says breaking story, one would have assumed that at that particular time as a breaking story. The hawks are on their way to Ace Mahashuda's house. That's the breaking story. That to be told that Ace is going to be arrested. We knew that story three weeks ago, a month ago. That story has been peddled around the media and social media. That is a possibility that the NTSG is facing arrest. Therefore, then, to run and create that kind of uh, hysteria among the, the public and South Africans that is going to be arrested, that to me was not journalism. And I don't want to attack or deal with a journalist per se or deal with a publication concern. All I'm saying is that we have to take a step back and say that go and verify with your sources. That story, to be honest, that was not journalism. That was just something else. That was just a journalism. It's, yeah, I was reading an article by the Daily Maverick and they're suggesting that this might have been created by the subject of the story himself. I'm not going to interrogate whether that's true or not, but rather to ask a question more about, do we need to be careful as journalists what we are being told and by who and to what end? Peter, as a media trainer, I often say that, and, and I fought with a lot of editors. There are stories that, you know, we need time, that one can unpack, that one will tell you that this is not a story. One of the things, look at the timing of the story. Look at the source. Don't just get excited about that. I've got a scoop. Yes, every media house wants to be the first to, to break in this story or that. But ensure that you stick to the basic tenets of journalism. 
And also, your gut feel will tell you. However, where I'm also saying that there are journalists who goes rookie is this part of the story, where I can tell you now that story should not have been that kind of a story. The timing of it was ill-timed. The person who was, who was the source is suspicious, is suspected to be the very same person who was going to be arrested. Therefore then, to me and to anyone who has studied journalism, media sociology, that is not journalism. That will never be journalism. That cannot constitute any form of journalism, even if you trust your source or not. Uh, and I know that another concern that you have is uh, how uh, journalists sometimes behave at uh, press conferences, for example. Take us through some of the things that you've seen. Shocking, Peter. Over the years, you know, I follow a lot of press conferences. Quite, it's quite interesting now that most of them are live. You look at the kind of questions that journalists ask, even senior journalists to say. It's quite sad that a person didn't do basic research. In the yesterday years, when we started in journalism, Research was important. And you know how to, to do research? You to go to the library of the newspaper to get newspaper clippings to do your research. Now, everything is just at the click of the button. They don't do research. How do you go to a press conference without doing a proper research, asking off-site questions? Two, off, off late, I'm shocked that the number of journalists are referring to Julius Malema as the CIC. His title is Mr. Malema to journalists. Nothing more, nothing less. Isma Khashoggi himself is not anything but Mr. Mahashule to journalists. For a journalist to say, to say that, speak as if one is in the branch meeting and stuff like that, that erodes the public trust that we have in the media. And that is something that some of us will fight for, will guard against that it doesn't get eroded. We will have to nip this in the bud. Journalism ethics cannot be compromised as much as they have been happening. I'm not saying that this is a crisis, but we need to deal with it so that it doesn't become a crisis. All right. There's been conversations over time about the juniorization of the newsroom. And I just wonder, how do we fix this? Because it seems that um, those that were kind of the stalwarts of journalism that have gained all this experience end up as spokespersons for government ministers or communications managers in industry because they pay better. So there's financial pressure, there's um, shrinking newsrooms in terms of size and this issue of the juniorization of the newsroom? Peter, there is nothing wrong with juniorization of the newsrooms. All of us started as young cup journalists. We had men, women with gray hair who held us by the head. I can give you a typical example. My first day in the newsroom, I had a senior journalist who started journalism when I was born. His name is Joshua Raboro took me through the steps when I started as a journalist fresh from college. What we have to point this to, the problem is media owners themselves who have decided that they are doing away with experienced veteran journalists. It's not about journalists going to become spokespersons. It's, those are issues of economics. And I followed your, your conversation the, the, the other day uh, with uh, two of the former journalists uh, who, are, who are now spokespersons. There is nothing wrong with it. It's an interesting subject. It's quite important that they move, they grow, they make a difference within the government and, and, and media space. But the problem is that when young kids are thrown into the deep end, some of them without proper writing, because as, as you know, the WhatsApp language has, the mixed language has ruined very simple thing of comprehension. So what you are saying is that let's go to basic and look at what's happening at the all of our lane. And the solution also in the article that I've written and some of them is that let's get all those senior journalists with experience help at institutes of higher learning where journalism is being taught so that when these students move from being students to being journalists, they are at least 30 percent, 50 percent ready. It cannot be right that most of them, they cannot even churn a single story. They cannot even write a coherent paragraph or a sentence. So that problem, honestly, should be pointed at the owners of the media who are, not, who are also not failing, who are failing to invest also in training of these young kids that are coming into up the ladder. So the important thing is that senior veteran journalists should be used as the ones who basically help these ones to go up the ladder. This thing is quite simple. It has happened. We are taught by the likes of Don Matera, the likes of Joshua Rabolo, the likes of Agri So it is not something that, you know, it, it's quite impossible. 
Laura, so we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, but I think this is a conversation we probably need to have uh, more and more often. But thanks so much indeed for sharing your thoughts mm -hmm. and your insights, and let's hope the media owners and managers are listening. Thanks so much indeed, Temba Spotekel. Welcome back, you're still watching Media Monitor. And uh, during the show, often we try and uh, take a look at what's happening with the plight of journalists across the continent, highlighting some of the challenges and issues that journalists uh, continue to face. And we begin in the north of the continent, where Egypt's prosecutor general this past week ordered the release of Egyptian journalist Basma Mustafa after she was interrogated over accusations that she published false news. Mustafa, a journalist with the Al Mansa Manasa website, uh, was detained in Luxor, accused of exploiting her social media account to promote false news that would disturb public peace and her security. Her employer said that she'd been arrested whilst reporting on the alleged killing of a man by police during demonstration. Despite her release, authorities say that investigations into the accusations against her will continue. Now, a couple of months ago, we reported a story of a Cameroon journalist, Samuel Wazizi, who died in police custody in 2019. And for a long time, the authorities had denied any knowledge of his whereabouts and then finally admitted this year that the journalist passed away in detention. Now, the body of the journalist uh, still not been returned to his family, who has been waiting for his body so that, that they can find closure and give him a dignified burial. It's not clear why the authorities haven't released the body, but according to a report by the Cameroon Intelligence Report, they say that a sudden Cameroon's officer serving with the intelligence unit of the Rapid Intervention Battalion informed them that Wazizi's body may have been cut into pieces after he was killed. All right, that's a tragic story, and we certainly hope that the family does get some closure uh, with the return of uh, the body. Now, in our Back in History feature this week, we take you back to the 15th of October, 1993, and that's when Clive Darby Lewis and Polish immigrant Janusz Walusz were sentenced in the Rand Supreme Court uh, to death for the murder of uh, SA Communist Party leader Chris Honey. This is how the SABC covered the story. Janusz Walusz and Clive Darby Lewis were each sentenced to death this afternoon for killing SACP General Secretary Chris Harney earlier this year. Karu Creel reports that neither man showed any emotion as Transvaal Judge President Mr Justice C.F. Ierloff passed sentence. Visuals by Dieter Goddard. It was the moment these people had been waiting for. The news of the verdict spread like wildfire through the city streets. In passing sentence, Mr. Justice Ierloff said the murder was deliberate, cold-blooded and cowardly in the extreme. He said Walush and Darby Lewis were in on the murder together. And an aggravating fact in passing sentence was that they never showed any remorse. Walush was jovial with his arrest. Justice Ierloff said the sentence sent out a clear message to deter people contemplating assassination. Supporters left the court triumphantly. Minutes before, the packed courtroom erupted with the sound of Inkosi Sikilere Africa, drowning out an attempt at destem by a handful of right-wingers. As ANC leaders accompanied Mr. Hani's widow outside, the mood spelled victory. But Dim Fohani said she felt indifferent towards the death penalty being imposed. Their sentence doesn't bring my husband back. Their sentence doesn't bring the father of my three daughters back. The protest of my husband's assassination should be brought to court. Then we'll have true peace. We have to have peace in South Africa. For the crowd, the waiting was not in vain, as Mr. Hani's SACP successor, Charles Ngakula, and ANC leaders made their victory speeches. The ANC's Tokyo Sekwali said the lives of Valush and Darby Lewis were now in the hands of the people. Mr. Justice Ierloff said for many people, Mr. Hani was a hero and a leader, and that Valush and Clive Darby Lewis should have foreseen that his death could lead to widespread chaos. 
And we're staying on news archives now and uh, this back in history feature. And uh, we take a look at uh, this story, uh, which is on the 13th of October 1990, when South Africa held its first lesbian and gay pride march that was held in Johannesburg. This is how the news team covered the story. This public gathering and procession by supporters of gay rights took place in Johannesburg today. The event was organized by the gay and lesbian organization of the Front. The procession was preceded by a rally at which Parliament was called on to stop treating homosexuals as criminals. Speakers also called for homosexuals to be allowed equal benefits with regard to insurance, pensions, tax, and the right to adopt children. A self-proclaimed homosexual theological uh, graduate, Hendrik Pretorius, sharply criticized the church's standpoint on homosexuality. The procession through the streets of Bramfontein and Hillbrow took place in pouring rain. Those who took part in the procession shouted slogans and carried placards. Welcome back. You're still watching Media Monitor. Let's now take a look at what's uh, happening in our newspapers. At the beginning of the program, we showed you what was on the front pages. Well, uh, our, this morning, our media analyst is Merlo uh, Mahulelejo, who's uh, um, uh, joining us now to take us through what stories caught his attention. Thanks so much indeed for joining us, uh, Merlo. All right, so where do we start? Uh, good morning, Peter, and good morning to your viewers. I think for me, the stories that I'd like to start with this morning, I don't know if you have the report, it's the headline on the report, yeah. where they're saying that uh, Hona's death uh, is the police fault. And the other one is the headline on the front page of the Sunday Independent, where they're talking about angry protesters warn uh, white farmers. And the angle of analysis that I'd like to take here is that Often in the South African media landscape, we have talked about the notion that there are different perspectives to reporting stories, there are different angles and there are different editorial policies. I think for me in this uh, cynical story where obviously there was that uh, farmer that was uh, brutally uh, murdered and then there was the subsequent protest uh, where there was a clash between the white farmers and the police and the town of Senegal and the free state. For me, what these stories contrast is that if you look at the sort of readership of Sunday Independent and you look at the readership of uh, Rapport, it's two different constituencies. So, and then this is reflected in the way that these stories are positioned. The Sunday Independent story speaks mainly about it being the fault of white people, white people not uh, trying to uh, come onto the party in terms of the reconciliation project in the country, white people being uh, lawless and so on. If you read the rapport angle, the rapport angle, it is sort of like a more of a compassionate angle towards the farmer. The farmers, uh, they're trying their best to uh, make ends meet. The farmers are trying to abide uh, within the confines of the law, but then the police are just not meeting them halfway. And I think the in the rapport also, you're seeing that the angle that's coming through there is that the thing is, is mainly focused on a stock theft or livestock theft. The farmers are reporting that no, they've written multiple times to the hawks to tell them that there are thieves that are coming uh, during the night to steal their livestock and so on, and the police are not doing anything on that. So if you look at both stories, both of them in terms of facts, I mean, they're very clear, there's no dispute between facts, between the two stories, the one in the Sunday Independent, the one in Rapport. Factually, everything's the same. You can even say that to a certain level, they're both objective in the reporting. But then what comes across is that it's two different perspectives in two different angles in terms of reporting the stories. And I think this is something that we've always tried to stress uh, in terms of trying to explain the South African media landscape and saying that it does not mean that just because another person has a different perspective to you, that the facts that they're reporting are wrong, or that there's some, the fact that somebody's reporting uh, differently from you, that they're wrong, or they're trying to influence people in the wrong direction. It's just different ways of seeing a story. It gives you a more holistic picture in terms of what we're doing. So I think for me, that is something that obviously we've missed in the South African uh, media discourse. And obviously, going back to things like, for example, ANN7 versus 
I suppose the traditional mainstream media houses, and suppose now within the broader context of the battle between what some journalists may perceive as Sunday Independent being a rogue, uh, suppose um, not even not Sunday just Sunday Independent, the, but the independent independent group being a rogue uh, arm of sort of like the mainstream media establishment. I think what we need to appreciate and we need to inculcate in South Africa is the fact that they have different perspective to reporting different stories, and we need to recognize that there isn't a single universal level, even if we we are both reporting factually correct stories. Well, I mean, that's quite fascinating because I often, an example that I use to explain what you've just said is that you go to a football match and uh, a striker takes a penalty and the goalkeeper saves it. And the headlines could be a striker misses a penalty or goalkeeper saves a penalty. Both are true, but it's the perspective, isn't it? So where does that leave the reader then? What must we do? Are we buying several papers instead of one? Or uh, is this a healthy thing for to have these different, so many different perspectives? I think absolutely the example that you made, Peter, hits the nail on the head. I mean, and makes it very clear for uh, viewers at home to actually understand this difference. For me, what I think it does is that we need to sort of like inculcate the spirit within the broader media landscape in South Africa and also educate, I suppose, uh, viewers, listeners, and readers in terms of different perspectives or reporting stories. Yes, you, if, I mean, it's not something new. I mean, even like, for example, if you take within the family context, people know that even within a single event, we'll have different family members have different view, ways of viewing a single story. So I don't think it's something that is foreign to, uh, uh, viewers or readers, but it's just something that needs to be made explicit. I think for me, where I fault, I suppose, the media, uh, the mainstream media landscape within the country is that they've always tried to present a perspective that there is one universal way of reporting stories and that there are certain institutions which are more trusted than others because their perspective is the absolute correct perspective. I don't think that is a correct thing. And I think, for example, if we look at maybe, for example, the United States, in the United States, the different perspectives are very clearly delineated within the media landscape. If you're looking at CNN, you know that you're getting some sort of centrist uh, perspective. If you're looking at Fox News, you know you're getting some sort of right uh, wing perspective. If you're looking at MSNBC, you're getting some sort of left wing uh, media perspective. So viewers then correspond and choose the perspective that they would like uh, to listen to. But then they, at no point are they under the illusion that there is a single universal uh, medium that's giving them the different perspectives. All right. Is there any other story that caught your attention in the in the newspapers? Yes, uh, I think the next story, obviously, the big one is the Ace Mahashule and the Hawks story. I think for me, the obviously the interesting thing is it came out during the week. Uh, there were reports. Uh, I think uh, Sunday, uh, well, the independent group might have been um, one of the leaders in breaking the story. Uh, I think other media establishments also followed because I saw in Twitter streams the uh, different media houses also started uh, reporting about this uh, warrant of arrest that has been issued for Isma Khashoggi. I think for me, the interesting thing there obviously is that from a political perspective, is that it's a very um, so it's a very contentious issue with regard to the executive now trying to uh, arrest, I suppose, um, a political, a leading political figure in the governing party. I think for me, this has like uh, vast uh, consequences for President Ramaphosa if something like this were to happen. Because what it does is that it takes us back to an environment of, I suppose, the pre-Zuma years. If you remember when we had the Scorpions, where this whole narrative started brewing, and especially it was being, uh, I think, fanned on in the media landscape that their uh, uh, government institutions are being used to facilitate political fights. I think for me, that obviously, it takes us back a little bit back to that type of period. But I think what's going to be different this time, obviously, is the notion that um, in terms of, uh, I suppose, arresting, uh, Isma Khashule is not a government official. Isma Khashule is a party official. So to the extent that you're trying to say that you're going to remove him from government, you can't do that because he's not in government, he's a party official. If within the ANC constitution, there isn't a provision that allows anybody to be able to remove uh, the secretary general of the ANC, be it the NEC or the NWC, outside of instituting formal disciplinary proceedings against such a, an individual. If the way to institute disciplinary hearings, I think what it would do is that it would fracture the ANC internally and it would debilitate and collapse 
President Ramaphosa's capacity to be able to govern this country. So I think on the one side, obviously, we need to balance issues of justice and issues of redress using the ju uh, judiciary. But I think on the other hand, also, we have to look at issues of governance and stability of political governance within this country, which is why for me, I think even if you take all the media reports at face value that there are arrest or there, are, there is an arrest warrant being issued or there isn't an arrest warrant being issued. I think there's a broader uh, political stability question that needs to be answered within this context. All right, so in the city press, one of the issues raised is the lawyers are saying to the Hawks and the National Prosecuting Authority, do not dare make this a media spectacle. You cannot humiliate our client uh, by arresting him in front of the media, if that's the case, we will cooperate. And I'm just wondering, does he have a right to ask for the media not to be there? He's a public figure. No, he, he does not. In strict legal terms and in strict, strict uh, operational procedure terms, I do not think he has that right to ask for any special treatment. But then where this is going to come back and hit Ramaphosa in, in terms of political stability and the governance uh, environment within the country. So I think that's the trade-off that he needs to make. Yes, the hawks, I mean, as we've seen recently with the arrest of Edwin Sodi and so on, a lot of people have been mentioning that the media's involvement in this uh, Hollywood type of arrest harks back to a period of the of the scorpions and what they were doing before they were dismantled. I think obviously we're having a little bit of that and it does serve a bit of a purpose because I mean, one of the things that we've been saying over and over again, and I think also with the establishment of the Zondo Commission that has come out prominently is that you mustn't just do justice, but then there must be a perception of justice being done. And I think having the media within this type of space where people are getting arrested and whatever, it creates that impression and it fosters, I suppose, that sense of the justice is being done within the common populace. All right. Melo, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much indeed for a great analysis, interesting uh, perspectives uh, that you raised there. Thanks so much indeed for joining us and uh, we'll chat again soon. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Thanks so much. That's media analyst Melo Mahulejo joining us there on uh, Media Monitor, talking, taking us through the newspapers and an interesting perspective of how different stories can be told with different shades. Anyway, thanks very much indeed for joining us on the show on uh, Media Monitor. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us and uh, join us next week at the same time for more of the same. In the meantime, have a great day and uh, stand by for the agenda.